My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing on Corida Street in the very heart of ancient Ephesus. This is an important street for you and me. It was the central street of the city, but history says Timothy at the age of 80 was martyred for his faith on this very street. But he was the pastor of the church here until the time that he was martyred. The apostle Paul wrote to him and prophesied that at the end of the age, there would be a mass exodus from the faith. That really is what Paul prophesied. Peter prophesied the same thing. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, Peter says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Then listen to what he says about false teachers at the end of the age. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. What do you and I do when we know a leader has veered from the faith and is no longer teaching the time-tested truths of Scripture? What do we do with that kind of a leader? How do we pray for that kind of person? Is there something that you and I are supposed to do? The Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And if a leader has veered from the truth, if a leader has been seduced by seducing spirits and doctrines of demons and has gone in a wrong way, what happens to them? Well, the Bible says the Lord knows how to deliver them. The Lord knows how to get them out of the mess and get them back on track. But you and I have a part to play in this. What is our role? When we see a leader has veered from the truth, what are we supposed to do? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. This is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And today, we're going to jump right into our text where we're looking at how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. And I'm offering you my book by that same title called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, Developing Discernment for These Last Days. Denise is with me. Denise, you've read this book. What do you think of it? I think that the title is so excellent because that book really helps you keep your head on straight. Your head on straight about what? About what's going on in this world and how to get through it and how to not, not lose or compromise with everything else that's going on. Not to be deluded by seducing spirits, which seem to really be working in the earth today. And actually, the Bible prophesied that would happen. We're going to see that in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. We've got to keep our head on straight. If the world around us loses their minds, we're not supposed to. We're supposed to keep our head on straight, and that's what this book is about. It will really help you. Rodney Howard Brown recently read this book. I want to tell you what Rodney said. He said, the signs of the time encompass a departure from the faith, but Rick lays out the blueprint for the last day's church to get back on track. Isn't that powerful? I love it. Mark Barclay says, This book intelligently and boldly diagnoses not only the plague of our times, but supplies the healing and the formula for future resistance. I just think that is a remarkable endorsement. Anyway, all of that is about this book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. And we're offering you the series by the same title. It's 15 parts. It comes in multiple formats and it is available on our website. Order your copy today. And when you're contacting us, if you need prayer, we're here for you. We believe in prayer. Denise and I really pray for our partners. We pray for our TV family. That's what we call you. And our team is waiting to receive your call or your email so they can put their faith together with yours. But today I'm going to talk to you about how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. And our anchor verse for this series is 
1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. So let's look at it and review it very quickly. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul. And Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. When the Bible says the Spirit speaks expressly, it's the Greek word ratus. It means emphatically, definitely, what he's describing is something that most assuredly will come to pass. Now, the Holy Spirit is not speaking to scare us. He's trying to prepare us. He wants us to be prepared, especially those of us that are living at the outer rim of the last days. We're living in that time. And so we need to be prepared. So the Holy Spirit to us says emphatically, in the strongest and clearest of language, describing unquestionably what definitely will take place. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, that word latter, the Greek word hysteros, when there's nothing left of time, when you come to the very end, the very, very end of the age, some shall depart from the faith. Not everyone. Praise God, everybody's not departing from the faith. There's actually a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit happening all over the planet right now. But in the midst of this great outpouring, there's also a contingent of people that are beginning to depart from the faith. And that word depart describes a very slow, methodical, seducing departure, step by step, bit by pit, day by day, a departure happening so slow, so seductively that those who are in transition may not even realize they are in transition. But the Bible says they're departing from the faith. In Greek, it has a definite article, which means they're departing from the sound teaching of Scripture. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Giving heed really means their minds are so wide open that their brains have just about fallen out. Giving heed, pros, uh, echo, pros means to lean in a new direction, echo to embrace. They're leaning towards something new to embrace it, but they can't embrace the new thing until first they let loose of the old thing. What are they letting loose of? They're letting loose of the faith. Verse by verse, teaching of the Bible, the authoritative voice of Scripture, the immutable voice of Scripture, they're beginning to release it and they're beginning to open their mind to other things, to other systems of thought. And the Apostle Paul says, make no mistake, working behind these new progressive ways of thinking are seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That is clearly what the Bible prophesies. Paul prophesies it. Jesus prophesies it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. Peter prophesies it. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, and now we've seen that Jude also prophesies about it in Jude beginning in verse 3. So let's jump back there real quick. Jude verse 3, and then we're going to see how to deal with this. Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend, earnestly contend, the Greek word ep agonizomai, it means to really wrestle over, to fight over the faith. The words the faith again have a definite article. This is not faith for miracles or faith for signs and wonders or faith for the miraculous. This is for the faith. This is doctrine. This is for the Bible. It's a fight for the Bible, which the enemy would love to diminish and tell everybody it's just a relic from the past that no longer has a voice or any relevance in today's society. He wants to totally put the Bible aside because the devil knows the Bible has the power to change lives and to change society. That's why demonic spirits have been released in the end of the age. They're trying to relocate the Bible to the past as something that no longer has relevance for an end time society. Mm. But my friends, the Bible's the Bible and truth never changes. Society changes, the times change, the whims of the times are changing all the time. The Bible is unchanging truth. But what if you know someone that is modifying what they believe? They're already subject to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Or maybe you have a child that's beginning to embrace things, and it's just difficult for you to even imagine that your child will begin to embrace such nonsense. Maybe you know someone that's questioning their gender. They don't know if they're a boy or if they're a girl, or they're tempted to question even that. It's hard to believe how people have seemed to have lost their minds in these last days. It's really delusional spirits, and that's what Paul prophesied 
in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. But what if you know someone in that condition? Or maybe you know a spiritual leader, someone beloved, someone respected. But now they're beginning to veer off course. You can hardly believe what they're embracing, what they're endorsing, what they're promoting, and it's just shocking to you. If you know someone in any of those cases, what should be your response? To be angry at them? No, anger doesn't ever help. To get in a nasty, mud-slinging fight with them? No, that's not the behavior of the Spirit of God. That never helps anybody. That doesn't help anybody. It sure doesn't help you. Are you supposed to wring your hands and worry about them? No, worry is a sin, and worry doesn't do anything. Then what are you supposed to do if you know someone that's in one of these dangerous spiritual situations? Jude tells us in Jude, beginning in verse 22. Listen to what Jude tells us. Jude is very concerned about this himself because he knows people that are wandering from truth. And so he speaks for himself and he speaks for his readers and he speaks for you and me. And here's what Jude says. Of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. But let's look at this word compassion. This particular Greek word for compassion describes the deep-seated, unsettling emotions that a person feels when he has seen or heard something terribly sad or upsetting. He is so disturbed, profoundly disturbed because of something that he has seen. But he's not just disturbed, he's moved to do something about it. That's what this particular word for compassion means. Pity doesn't do anything. Compassion changes everything. Compassion comes with actions. And actually the word that is used in this verse, here translated compassion, describes the emotions you might feel when you see a child that is starving and whose stomach is bloated from malnutrition. If you see something like that, do you just wring your hands and say, oh, that's so pitiful? Or do you find food to give to that child? You're moved to do something to help that child. Or maybe you know someone that's dying of a terminal disease. Do you just wring your hands and say, oh, it's so terrible? Or do you do everything you can to provide medical care? You move. You do something to help them. Or maybe you know a family that's destitute. They're living out of the car. They have no money. Their kids have nothing to eat. Do you just wring your hands and say, oh, I just don't know what to do about this? Or do you provide food? You provide food. The word compassion that is used in this verse is not just pity. It is compassion that moves one to action. That's very important in the context where we're talking about believers that are in sin, believers that have wandered from the truth, or leaders that have become errant leaders. Do we just wring our hands and say, oh, it's so terrible? No, no, no. That won't accomplish anything. We need to be moved with compassion to do something about it. Now, the question is, what can we do? And the answer is very simple. We can pray. Our prayers are effective. And Denise, I believe you had a verse you wanted to share about that. <laughs> we can begin to pray, and through our prayers, God will trigger a flow of divine compassion that brings deliverance to those that are caught in deception. Compassion will begin the process to set them free, and that compassion is released when we begin to pray and we begin to intercede. Denise? Well, James 5 16 says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And if, we, if Jesus is in us, if we've been saved by him, the Bible says we are righteous by the blood of Jesus, by faith in his blood. Now it says that that fervent prayer avails much. So we can take that person in prayer who we care about, who we have compassion for, probably maybe even cried over and pray for them because we have authority with God and we have a confidence before God that if we pray, it's going to be very effectual. It's just very important that we pray and that we believe and that we ask and that we intercede for their deliverance. So it's not just enough to see the problem and acknowledge the problem and to feel bad about it. That's what pity does. But compassion adds action. And the action that we need to add is prayer. 
and of some having compassion. Act. Feel something for them, but do something about it. Put action to it. And in fact, the verse goes on to say, making a difference. That's what Jude says. And if some have compassion, making a difference. The first thing this tells me is we can make a difference in the life of someone else. But when you read this in the Greek text, there's a real clue here that is very important about people that have bought into a lie. The Greek word is diakrino. It describes an individual who has lost his ability to separate right from wrong. Mm. Wow. Or it can depict those unable to tell the difference between the truth and a lie. You know, sometimes people have been so regularly bombarded with lies and false images that it begins to affect the way that they think and they kind of become calloused or reprobate and they lose their ability to know what's right, what's wrong. And that's really what this word diacrino means. It describes believers or spiritual leaders who have gone astray. They have now developed a chronic instability in what they believe. Diacrino describes a chronic instability. They ultimately began to doubt God's word itself, often even questioning the most basic fundamentals of scriptural truth. They become so spiritually unstable that they begin to chronically question and even doubt important Bible truths that they once believed and embraced. And by using this word, the Greek word diakrino, here translated in the King James Version, making a difference, Jude tells us that deceived individuals are unable to reach accurate conclusions by themselves because they are so violated. As a result, they embrace what they once deemed to be spiritual error or even morally wrong. It's amazing to me that people who once walked with God and who walked by a very strict righteous standard today, they're embracing things which morally are so in contradiction to the Bible and they embrace them very freely. How did they get from here to there? Well, because of seducing spirits that lured them off track. They let loose of what was once precious and dear and begin to open their mind to new systems of thought and now diacrino, they're beginning to question everything. But the Bible says you can make a difference in their life if you will release a divine flow of compassion. And Rick, I want to add that they started to talk to themselves. They started to apologize for the Bible instead of standing up for the Bible or standing up for the truth. It's a very scary thing when we start to apologize or back up or water down what God says. We lose our footing when we start apologizing for the Bible or not standing up. And then we become uh, accessible to these spirits that are speaking on the earth. Honey, that is so good. Thank you for saying that. But when we continue in Jude, Jude continues to say that we are to pull them out of the fire. Mm. Pulling in Greek is the word harpazo. Wow, this word harpazo is so strong. It means to snatch just in the nick of time. Mm. It is the picture of laying hold of and snatching someone out of a dangerous situation, which means through prayer, through the act of compassion. Compassion is now flowing from our heart. And as we follow that flow of compassion, we don't just feel pity, but we begin to add our prayers. Like Denise said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You add your prayer to what you feel and your prayer literally begins to seize them and snatch them out of destruction. And of course, when we talk about that, I can't help but think about Lot. Here was Lot, a man who also veered from what was right. Lot knew the life of faith. He had walked with his uncle Abraham. When Abraham built the altar of God, who do you think helped him build the altar? Lot helped him build the altar. When Abraham launched out in faith, who was with him? Lot was with him. Lot knew a lot about walking in faith. But when we come to the book of Genesis, we find that this man who knew a lot has veered so far from his foundations that he's living in Sodom. And the Sodomites, these men who were homosexuals and were involved in all kinds of perverseness, when Lot goes out and speaks to them, he is so veered from his original foundation, he addresses them as brethren. 
This was a man who was really messed up. He started out right, but he veered from his foundation. And Abraham, through his prayers, snatched Lot out of the fires of destruction. Abraham stood before the Lord. The Bible tells us that he drew near to the Lord mm -hmm. and he began to intercede for Lot. He didn't just say, woe is me, Lot's there, Lot's going to be destroyed. He drew near to the Lord when he saw how serious was Lot's situation. You have to draw near to the Lord. Release that flow of compassion, begin to pray those effectual prayers that you can pray because you're righteous. And through your prayers, you can harpazo, pull them out of the fires of destruction. Rick, can I say something about prayer? When we we give our time to prayer, when we give our time to praying for that person, we, you begin to feel the emotions or the thoughts or the feelings that God has about this situation. And that's powerful prayer. When you can see how he feels about it and you agree with him, that's praying with the Holy Ghost and that's powerful praying. And that kind of praying is effectual. Wow, this is so helpful today. But I want to go back to Jude. And I want to translate this verse for you based on the Greek words that we've studied so far today. Listen to this. If you take all these Greek words that we've looked at and put them all together, the verse could be translated like this. Now listen to this. I call this an RIV. It's Renner's interpretive version of these verses. <laughs> you must have a compassionate attitude toward those so spiritually calloused that they no longer know the difference between right and wrong. The truth is, these unstable people are living right on the brink of disaster and are in real spiritual jeopardy. Their plight is so grave that it requires you to put into action an immediate rescue plan to snatch them from the fires of destruction. And that rescue plan is following that flow of compassion toward them to pray for them. You have to understand the compassion is a spiritual force. It's a spiritual force. Don't be judgmental of them. That doesn't help. What's that going to change? That's just going to make your heart hard and filled with bitterness. It's going to have bad attitude about them. Uh, don't have a bad attitude. They are victims. They are victims of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They have bought into a lie. They need compassion that is mixed with prayer that reaches into the flames of judgment to snatch them so that they can be set back on a right path. And they can be. That's how powerful, that is how effective you are. Through your prayers, you can literally reach into the flames of destruction and snatch them from it so they don't sink with the rest of society. That's how much power you have. So if you see a leader that has veered, or if you know a family member or a fellow believer that's become wayward in their faith, and you're so shocked by what they're doing and embracing what they're saying. Don't just live in that state of shock. Put faith, put prayer to your compassion. Reach into the fires of judgment through your prayers and you can snatch them out of destruction. We're out of time, but we'll be back in just a moment and we're gonna pray for you. The world is changing. In fact, it's more than changed. It's gone crazy. We are living in a world where faith is questioned and sin is welcome where people seem to have lost their minds about what is right and wrong. It seems truth has been turned upside down. In Rick Renner's new book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, Rick reveals the disastrous consequences of a society in spiritual and moral collapse. In this book, you'll discover what Christians need to be doing to stay out of the chaos and anchor to truth. You'll learn how to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, discern right and wrong teaching, how to be grounded in prayer, and how to be spiritually prepared for living in victory in these last days. Leading ministers from around the world are calling this book essential for every believer. And right now, it's available for just $20. You can also order the 15-part teaching series when you call or go online right now. Rick takes you deep into New Testament prophecies about the end of the age and what you need to do to sail successfully through turbulent end-time waters. Available in digital or physical formats starting at just $24. Get the book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, for just $20. And don't miss this powerful teaching series. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now.
Pastor Rick uh, received that vision, that word from the Lord in 1978, write, 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 I will prosper what you write. And his obedience, it was a word for perpetuity. He's obeying it to this day and it will show no signs of stopping and the Lord is opening more doors for him through daily TV and all these study guides that accompany each and every series, each and every program, it's a word for perpetuity, it will not stop, it will increase. My friend, it is so exciting to see the lives that are being touched by the teaching of the Bible. Our ministry is exploding and we really need your help. So I'm asking you today to please pray about becoming a part of the giving team for our ministry expansion project. Today we've seen that Jude tells us what to do if we know someone that has veered from their faith or someone that's beginning to embrace the nonsense that society is promoting. What do you do in that case? Just wring your hands and worry about them? No, no, no. Jude tells us what to do in Jude, beginning in verse 22. He says, and of some have compassion. Mm -hmm. We've seen that that word compassion is a Greek word which describes the unsettling emotions a person feels when he sees someone in a very grave situation. He doesn't just wring his hands and say, oh, woe is me, this is so terrible. He's so moved by what he sees that he moves to act. He does something to help them. If they need food, he gets them food. If they need medical care, he wants to do everything he can to get them medical care. If it's a person who's trapped in drugs, you do everything you can to create an intervention to get them out of that situation. Is not pity, it's compassion. And compassion comes with action. And the action that will reach into the fires of destruction and snatch people before they are destroyed is prayer. You can pray just like Abraham prayed for Lot. The Bible says Lot was delivered because God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham's prayer. And because of that, he sent Lot out of the destruction. If you'll pray, God will reach through you, through your compassion, through your prayers, into the fires to deliver that person you're concerned about. That's what the Bible teaches. By the way, I'm offering you my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. And the series by the same title, it's 15 parts. Order both of these. I know they'll make a difference in your life. I just release the power of God to you and the compassion of God to be released from your heart toward those that have veered from the faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you in the next program. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.